good evening one and all what a fantastic evening today cca is known for its uniqueness of giving presenting webinars back to back without repetition of any single topic so this evening i am absolutely delighted to represent cca to moderate this webinar on the unique topic when to refer a patient for lung transplant my sincere thanks to entire organizing team of cci that includes nh krishnanna narayan pradeepa my brother cci president dr ashish dubey and cci national secretary uh, dr anil maske and today today i would like to introduce my esteemed panel here first of all that is let me take privilege in introducing all the four together first of all dr appa jindal great friend dynamic pulmonologist and reputed pulmonologist is a director of transplant program from mgm chennai welcome dr appa dr harshvardhan puri fantastic human being amazing thoracic surgeon recently upgraded his, his skills in lung transplantation from toronto welcome puri bai and again it's a proud privilege to introduce dr chaitanya who was my junior and amazing talented pulmonologist now upgrading her skills with toronto general hospital doing her fellowship clinical fellowship um at toronto and we are uh, we at apollo and hyderabad eager to receive her back from january 2024 so that we can avail her services dr pallavi purwar she is a senior consultant thoracic surgeon from gangaram delhi amazing dynamic lady welcome dr pallavi so with this i would like to mention each one of you really appreciate for your time spending here but again so getting a donor lung is not that easy job it is one of the most tedious procedure with that so much of transplant protocols set in in the west but in india the transplant protocols they have set in but they have not percolated into the grassroots level particularly with the practicing pulmonologists and practicing intensivists in various cities so that's why it's a rare commodity it's a very very prime duty to identify most appropriate recipient most matched recipient to the available donor i'm sure many of you who are attending they have gone through international society of heart lung transplantation guidelines but what is practically feasible back in india back in this versatile subcontinent is more important so in next one one and a half hour we will be dealing with a lot of practical aspects of lung transplantation heart lung transplantation in india i'm sure various intricacies in indications contraindications and practical aspects will be dealt to the finest detail possible first i would love to invite dr appa jindal followed by dr harshvardhan puri to talk on nuts and bolts bolts of lung transplantation by dr appa and then followed by dr harshvardhan puri will speak on the schema of lung transplantation what are the practical aspects of it over to you dr appa good evening friends 
Uh, welcome to this webinar by CCI. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Krishna and the entire organizing team, Dr. Vijay, who is also here with us, for giving us an opportunity to talk about the indications, the nuts and bolts, and the basics, both medical and surgical aspects, about lung transplant in this webinar. To begin with, I'm going to share a short presentation, and in the next 10 minutes, I'll be talking about the basics, the medical basics about lung transplant, and then we can take up more questions, and in the panel discussion that follows, we can take all these concepts up in a greater detail. So let me just start sharing my screen and bring up the presentation. Yes, I hope my presentation is visible. So to begin with, just I want to share the basics, the nuts and bolts of lung transplantation, and then we'll uh, talk about how it is different for the rest of the world and what are the challenges which are unique to our country. In the next 10 minutes or so, the various aspects that I'm going to be talking about will include indications for lung transplant, what is the importance for early referral? How about a bridge to transplant using an ECMO? Is it a feasibility? Is it a possibility? And is, why is it an underutilized therapy? How the outcomes have improved worldwide over the era? What are the indications for a combined heart and lung? And uh, what are the myths regarding a combined heart and lung versus just a lung transplant alone? And what are the challenges in the Indian setting? So to start with, the very basic thing is that who is a patient who should be referred for a lung transplant? What are the general indications for lung transplant? So there was a document that came out by the ISHLT, the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplant in 2014, which said that lung transplant should be considered for adults with chronic end-stage lung disease who meet the following general criteria, which include a high risk of mortality within two years if transplant is not performed, a high likelihood, a 90% likelihood of survival for at least 90 days post-transplant, and about an 80% likelihood of survival for five years post-transplant, given that the graft function is okay and in a general medical perspective. But upon great deliberation in 2021, ISHLT came out with the new guidelines and in it, the short-term survival criteria was taken away. And now a two-year mortality in the absence of a transplant and a long-term survival of a period of five years is what is considered as a general indication for the patient. So what are the diseases worldwide which are most amenable to transplant? As you can see from this graph, we have seen a larger increase in the number of ILD patients who are undergoing transplants, whether they are interstitial idiopathic pneumonias, IPF, or ILD non-IIPs, both are showing a you know, significant increase in the numbers of transplant. Whereas a constant number is seen in the cases of COPD, in cases of bronchiectasis, both cystic fibrosis and non-cystic fibrosis, and definitely a very small number of patients also do undergo retransplant over a period of time. And most of these cases worldwide are from the cystic fibrosis category. So talking about the four most important disease categories, what are the basics? What are the basic indications when you would refer a patient for lung transplant? So let's talk about ILD. And I will not go into greater details with all these diseases because we will take those up as questions and as the panel discussion proceeds. So for ILD, the important point to remember is at the time of diagnosing any fibrotic ILD, you need to bring up the dialogue about lung transplant with the patient. Once the FEC is less than 80% or the DLCO falls to less than 40%, the patient has any oxygen requirement and the patient fails to improve in terms of symptoms of dyspnea, oxygen requirement or lung function with appropriate medical therapy, you definitely need to refer this patient to the transplant unit. For COPD, a very, very important point that can be highlighted is the last point in that uh, column, which says poor quality of life which is unacceptable to the patient. And this usually happens when there is progressive disease despite maximal therapy, pulmonary rehabilitation, and oxygen therapy. Once everything is instituted and still the patient has a board index of five to six, which increases by one in the last 24 months, or a hypercapnic respiratory failure with an FEV1 of less than 25%, you have to refer this patient for a surgical option. Now, these surgical options can be lung volume reduction surgeries. Whether or not it is going to be bronchoscopic or surgical will be decided at, at uh, the level of uh, assessment of the patient. And a simultaneous referral to the transplant unit should also be made. For pulmonary hypertension, 
any patient who is in NYHA class three or four, despite escalating therapy, or any patient who is suspected of a PVOD or a PCH has to be referred for lung transplant. For cystic fibrosis or bronchic cases, again, like an ILD, since this is a progressive permanent disease, you need to discuss the option of transplantation at the time of diagnosis. But once the patient hits an FEV even of less than 30% or 40% with a six minute walk distance of less than 400 meters, any appearance of pulmonary hypertension and any clinical decline in the patient with acute respiratory failure requiring NIV, increase in the antibiotic resistance, worsening nutritional status, pneumothorax, or any life-threatening hemoptysis which does not respond to bronchial artery embolization, you definitely need to refer these patients for lung transplantation. Beyond this, why is it important to refer these patients in this stipulated period of time? When you refer the patient, you need to understand that this, is, this may not be the time when we list the patient and when we actively look for a donor for this patient. There is something called as a referral criteria and there is something called as a listing criteria. And the period in between these two is known as the transplant window. This is the period that the transplant unit utilizes to establish a rapport with the patient, prepare the patient for the transplant in terms of physical frailty, in terms of emotional frailty, in terms of social dependence. And of course, in our country, since it's an out-of-pocket pay, financial also has to be taken into account. So once you refer the patient, we assess the patient, we take care of all the important um, imperfections or all the important uh, improvements that need to be made in the patient and then we list the patient when the appropriate time comes. It is very important because as you can see from the graph that these patients have a very steep fall in their progression once they hit the end stage lung disease criteria. So once there is a rapid progressive disease, there is increase in the oxygen dependency, increase in hospitalizations, and overall decrease in the quality of life, this is the right time. This is the transplant window when you need to refer the patient to us and we need to list the patient actively. Why is it even more important is very clear from this graph from the UNOS data, which shows that when the patients are much more sicker than if they are referred for the transplant, that means they are referred at a later stage in their disease, there is an increased mortality while on the wait list. So a patient who is referred well in time, once he fits the criteria, will be able to survive uh, without any events throughout the waiting period and undergo a successful transplantation for a better future. You can see that over a period of time, the improval, improvement in survival is very evident, which came, which was around four years in the 1990s and has increased to about 10 years in the current era. And when we do it on a disease specific levels, you can see that cystic fibrosis, it does the best. And amongst the ILDs also, the IPF ILDs actually fare a little less better than the other IIPs. And the worst survival of all patients that is seen is in COPDs, which is as good as the other ILDs as well. But despite this, when we were speaking about the general indications, we said that two year mortality should be more than 50%. And you can see that the median survival, that means 50% survival benefit that you can offer even to a COPD patient is at on an average of around six years or so. So that is a very good survival advantage that you're offering to these patients. Let's talk about ECMO. And I'm just going to touch it very briefly in two slides over here. In the graph on the left-hand side of the slide, you can clearly see that the number of patients who are bridged to transplant using an ECMO is exponentially increased from the 90s to the 2000s. And the graph on the right clearly shows that there is a huge divide. That means a patient who is deteriorating in clinical condition and is waited on with ventilatory care alone versus a patient who is bridged to transplant. It is the survival benefit offered to this patient is almost as good as a survival benefit to a patient who is transplanted off of oxygen therapy. So ECMO is definitely an underutilized therapy. It is an um, advantageous therapy that these patients can utilize. What is the strategy? We prefer an upper body cannulation with a VV ECMO over a VA ECMO. Systemic anticoagulation is maintained at an ACT of around 140 to 160, which is at a lower level. You move towards extubation if possible, just maintain the patient on ECMO and physical therapy, rehabilitation, and ambulation is of utmost importance while the patient is on ECMO and waiting for transplant. 
Moving on to combined heart and lung transplants, very clearly, as I have highlighted over here, you can see that although the number is going on decreasing across the years, we do very few numbers of a combined heart and lung transplant. So the basic indication that remains is both end-stage heart failure and end-stage lung failure. Why that is so? Because it has been clearly shown that the right ventricular failure can be reversed by a double lung transplant alone. You do not need to transplant the heart in these cases. So what are the cases where you would need cutoffs in which double lung transplant is deemed inappropriate is they vary between 10% to 25% of right ventricular ejection fraction and between 32 to 50% of the left ventricular ejection fraction. So if you are in that range, you can consider a combined heart and lung transplant or a patient who has an uncorrectable congenital heart disease or a corrected congenital heart disease, which has again gone into Eisenmenger syndrome. These are the patients who would be deemed appropriate for a combined heart and lung transplant. So basically, it is required only in combined heart and lung failure. Pulmonary hypertension, even if it may be severe pulmonary hypertension, alone is not an indication for a combined transplant because the heart reverses, the right ventricle reverses and the heart comes back to normal. Transplant for COVID, we did the first transplant at MGM Health Center for any COVID in the Asian countries. And this our data has been taken up by the International Consort, and this was published in Lancet. Using all this data from across the world for whatever hundred of transplants that were performed for COVID ARDS patients, ISHLT in the 21 guidelines also included ARDS uh, as one of the indications for a transplant. And it clearly said that persistent requirement for mechanical ventilatory support or ECLS, which is ECMO, without expectation of clinical recovery and with evidence of irreversible lung destruction is an indication for lung transplant. Mind you, previously ECMO bridging as well as ARDS was considered as a relative contraindication to transplant, but now it has become as a direct indication for lung transplant. So what are the challenges that are unique to India? Let's talk about three different aspects, the donor aspects, the recipient aspects, and the institutional or government factor. The donor aspect, we do not have as many donors in the country as we see across the world. There is also a huge geographical divide where majority, 90% of the donations in the, in, in the country come from the southern states of Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Telangana. Maharashtra and Gujarat are picking up in their numbers, but we still need to see a lot more donors coming from North India. There is a lack of standardized donor management policy. There are Most of the donors are extended criteria donors, and definitely because of this, there is a demand and supply mismatch. Coming to the recipients, most of the cases are referred late to us. They are sicker, they are older, they are patients with multiple comorbidities and MDR pathogens. And at the same time, there is lack of government intent. There is no uniform allocation policy for the donors. There is small number of active programs. There are hardly about five or six active lung transplant programs in the country and none in the public sector and poor patient follow-up in the public sector programs. All of this leads to a lot of, uh, you know, area which, which can be developed to improve lung transplantation in the country. So I would conclude by saying that lung transplant is not an option for all patients. In carefully selected patients, it can provide significant morbidity and mortality benefits. Early referral is the key. Combined heart and lung transplant only for combined heart and lung failure. Bridging with ECMO is a feasibility with good outcomes improving outcomes over the era, and it is not devoid of challenges, but it is the need of the art with promising results. So I will leave you today with a thought which says always bear in mind that your own resolution to success is more important than any one other thing. So today is a good day to save lives, become an organ donor. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Harshwardhan Puri. I'm a senior consultant, lung transplant and thoracic surgeon at Institute of Chest Surgery and Lung Trans Transplant under the Medicity Gurugram. And today we'll be talking about overview of lung transplantation. Greetings from Medanta, the Medicity, my uh, hospital at present. Uh, we'll be talking about the pro process of lung transplants. And first thing which you need to do such a big surgery, such a great uh, uh, 
heavy loaded surgery is to te- train the team at, uh, for the, this thing and our whole team of uh, uh, transplant pulmonologists transplant surgeons interventionists coordinator and pulmonologists went to toronto general hospital to get trained for this uh, thing this is a picture of that uh, the schema of the presentation will be how the process of lung transplant happens so it starts with a referral then an evaluation then a listing a recipient management donor call management explantation implantation and post operative care and follow up so first thing is a referral whenever a referral comes to a transplant pulmonologist or transplant uh, surgeon in medanta what we do is a online consult to see uh, how the patient is behaving how well preserved he is or uh, how bad he is and to evaluate his reports so it is done by a transplant pulmonologist and a transplant surgeon at one go the uh, distribution after the after this online cons- uh, consultation we divide the patients into three two six for a transplant or doesn't qualify for a transplant merits evaluation or too good is so well preserved that a transplant should not be done at this moment but we we keep uh, these patients in our uh, data bank so the if we go for a merits evaluation then the patient is brought down to medanta for a 4 to 5 days evaluation in which a 44 different kind of test from base line cbc to high end right heart catheterization is done multiple uh, consultations are done by cardiologists gastroenterologists dental etc and then after this evaluation the patient is sent back a multidisciplinary team uh, sits down uh, which is which comprises of a transplant pulmonologist psychiatrist physiotherapist and lot many people and a decision about whether they are going ahead with the transplant of that patient takes place if the patient the, the decision is yes or no if it is a yes then the patient is conveyed uh, that yeah, yes we are going ahead with your transplant if it is a no the patient is put in under the category of best medical management and referred back to the referral physician so after if he is uh, taken up for a transplant or uh, we are going ahead with the transplant the patient is listed on a uh, national website which is known as noto uh, the uh, listing of the patient is done in that uh, website maintained by government of india after this starts the real journey of transplant what we are we do we call the patient uh, to the medanta counsel him about the merits the merits of the transplant and starts his optimization and management this compre- comprises of online as well as on site in online uh, physiotherapist and a pulmonologist sees him almost alternate day uh, and maybe daily sometimes and on site twice a week the medical management of his drugs as uh, suited to the transplant process is done by a pulmonologist nutrition support by a uh, diet chart is given by a dietitian emotional support by a psychiatrist at least once a week or uh, twice uh, twice weekly and the uh, transplant uh, the candidate is called to stay within 15 50 kilometers of medanta the magic city so that if we get a for the donor call the uh, recipient can be shifted to medanta as soon as possible this is very important important because the well you prepare a patient pre operatively the better the results in the post operative period are so the, the less the more you sweat in peace the less you bleed in war this is a uh, how a pre operative uh, physiotherapy sessions of these patients are done uh, on oxygen in our physiotherapy centers so one final when we receive a call that a donor is there in pala hospital we are um, and, and there is a, a national group where we get get all the details about the donor what is his height weight what is his uh, chest x ray what is his blood group and everything and then we match the donor uh, things with our recipients the things which we match are total lung capacity if a ct is available we uh, do volumetric matching blood group matching is done and uh, recipient the uh, matching recipient is called about his present condition and willingness for to go for the transplant this is last thing last conversation with the uh, recipient and the recipient is called to the to medanta the medicity after the acceptance of donor call we we put the acceptance on the noto uh, group and if a large organ is allotted to us now starts the race against time because we have to do everything in next 6 to 12 hours so as a team division should occur you uh, very well remember this uh, great photograph from shole at donor team and the recipient team the team is divided between aadhe idhar aadhe udhar and now starts uh, a conversation with the donor hospital the uh, uh, surgeon or the pulmonologist talks to the interventionist there for optimizing the hemodynamics or even distribution of vasopressors for fluid management we keep the uh, patient dry antibiotics theranom and optimal ventilation 
now moment for explantation the team uh, which is doing the explantation is uh, uh, plans the logistics so we check the logistics with the donor hospital how far it is how we are going to reach there and plan our lo logistics according to that air ticketing and everything and medanta has a aircraft of his uh, its own so we sometimes use this uh, private aircraft to go to the destination for uh, early retrieval and checklist if you want to make your life easy make a checklist for everything and we have made a checklist for explantation which is followed in every case before we are going for an explant at reaching a donor hospital who goes for a transplant lung transplant surgeon as and a coordinator a history and uh, checking of all documents is done we check the gases ct scan discussion with the lead surgeon in medanta bronchoscopy plus ball is done in all the cases and lung accepted provisionally based on the initial assessment this uh, checklist you are seeing on uh, your screen we give it to the uh, transplant anesthetist in the donor uh, sorry in the donor anesthetist in the donor hospital to keep the fio to at 50% the respiratory rate at 12 the beep at 5 and tidal volume at 400 so that the whole process of transplant explantation happens according to our ventilatory settings whenever we reach the donor hospital a small player we always do in the ot just to uh, for the noble soul because uh, that that person is doing a doing a great deed it is almost uh, done for around one week one minute and uh, we just we just pray for the noble soul before starting any explantation after that that the process of explantation happens in which we do externotomy dissection of the heart assessment of the lungs we assess the uh, lungs uh, manually and a p by f ratio if it is above 300 we take the lungs for, for uh, explantation we go ahead with explantation we do uh, explantation by dissection a pulmoplegia is done by a uh, catheter in the pa using perfadex plus four uh, uh, for 3 liter integrate and 1 liter retrograde explantation of heart is done first then explantation of lungs packing and transport the packing is done in 1 liter of perfadex and transport is done in this 10 degree stretch which we have procured from uh, toronto general hospital they have a theory that if the organs are preserved in at 10 degree temperature we can uh, preserve the organs for 12 to 24 hours return journey with lung the uh, lungs get all the priority so a green corridor is formed wherever we are this vip treatment is for not for us but for the organ of uh, procurement so so we are running against the time with uh, the first transplant we did we uh, got the organs from indraprast apollo and uh, we uh, uh, brought them to medanta in 17 minutes with, which usually takes around 45 to 15 minutes for uh, movement recipient admission preparation is done by the other uh, part of the team at medanta hospital the recipient surgery is done by a clamshell thoracotomy a bilateral dissection and preparation for pneumonectomy initiation of central va ecmo all the uh, transplants we are doing on va ecmo recipients pneumonectomy the first worst side is done first and till that time the uh, explant team also joins the implant team table uh, of the organ is done where uh, organ block is done where the uh, broad organ is separated between right and left lung the implantation is done in the um, process of bronchus first pa and then la cuff reduct then the reduction half of the flow of ecmo is reduced after doing first uh, implantation then the implantation of other side is done then taking of the patient taking the patient off ecmo uh, it, it is done according to a protocol closure and shifting to icu this is the clamshell thoracotomy i was talking about this is a new uh, thing in transplant uh, medicine because most of the transplants initially were happening from a sternotomy which was was giving poorer results clamshell thoracotomy gives a wider uh, view of the cavity and a better control at the time of doing transplant uh, all the surgeries i told you now are being done most of the surgeries in the world transplants are being done on ecmo which is a step ahead of uh, from uh, doing it on cpvs and the results are far better the bronchial anastomosis is done first then the pulmonary artery anastomosis and then the la cuff anastomosis is done the uh, recipient surgery at the end of the surgery we take off all the recipients of ecmo we decrease the flow from 5 to up to 500 and 1 liter flow every minute re reduction is done optimize ventilation adequate tidal volume fio to 30 to 60% percent peep of 5 to 8 if there is hypoxemia go back to 3 liters exchange double lumen tube do proper bronchoscopy start nitric oxide and again we start weaning off the patient a patient we we take it as a uh, policy to wean off all the patients from ecmo this is a specimen pick of uh, the first transplant we, which we did uh, it was a bilateral extensive bronchiectasis these are the specimen picks of that this is the post 
now uh, when the patient is shifted back to the uh, icu he is maintained on ventilation for around 72 to 4 days and then he is extubated started on extensive physiotherapy this is a small video of uh, a patient of our transplant doing physiotherapy in icu this is our uh, transplant uh, physiotherapist dr deepika making him do lot of physiotherapy so these patients are kept in the ward for next 10 to 15 days and then discharge uh, accordingly first patient be discharged on 15th day second on 21st day third on 17th day so average uh, period is around 15 to 20 days and a very close follow up of these patients is done a whatsapp group is formed uh, in between these patients and the transplant team and they have to put the daily fev1 uh, and their problems and uh, exercise video uh, on those uh, platforms this is an exercise video of our first transplant three months post transplant doing excellently well in uh, in his hometown and this is the result which which provides you too much of gratification too much of happiness when you see your transplant patients moving uh, to your opds without any oxygen doing very well thanks a lot friends and uh, by the way we did our fifth transplant yesterday night uh, i'm just uh, doing this presentation post first post on the first post of the of uh, five, uh, our fifth transplant thanks a lot that's brilliant presentation from both of you dr apar and uh, uh, dr puri puri bhai thoda sa pani pee lo okay got exhausted <laughs> non stop it is something like it's a challenge huh? you did it but thanks to both of you for uh, excellent presentations and also sticking on to the time that's most important i want to give some rest to both of you and then i want to rope in our uh, uh um transplant pulmonologist and then uh, uh dr chaitanya and then thoracic surgeon dr pallavi so chaitanya uh, what are the ideal uh, cases where you do uh, single lung or in some cases you prefer double lung what is the current evidence what it says uh actually a lot of patients now double lung transplantation is being done but thing is that uh, there are few criteria that it, uh, the age has also been shifted now we are not doing like 60 is a cut off or 65 is a cut off Right. these people here are doing around 79 78 uh, age group also so in elderly people or uh, for patients who uh, have a mild to moderate ph rather so the severe ph there is definitely a double lung transplant for mild to moderate ph uh, if it's only if they are a bit frail compared to that of uh, the other people so single lung can be opted uh, so double lung is the preferred method of transplantation and heart lung is also rarely done these days because majority of that is corrected by the double lung transplantation itself unless and until uh, the patient has a coexisting cardiac dysfunction like like uh, uh, pulmonary artery hypertension with congenital heart diseases causing significant hypoxemia it's an option it's only a heart lung transplantation which will be done so for these scenarios heart lung transplantation will be done or for advanced cardiomyopathies in connective tissue disorders along with the lung involvement it, they will be done but preferably double lung for majority of the people dr appar was mentioning uh, uh, aptly in his presentation that whenever there is a coexistent uh, uh, cardiac dysfunction to the tune of less than ef 30 35% probably he would uh, um, prefer to do a heart lung what is your idea uh, appar what is your thoughts Let, let me start you know with continuing with what chaitanya has uh, brought up the concept of single lung versus double lung so there was a time if you look at the data which was available between 2014 to 2016 uh, ishlt in in its own journal had uh, clearly published that the outcome with a double lung transplant is better than a single lung transplant but again they have revisited this and uh, uh, there is i think data from toronto and there is data from temple that even single lung transplant 
the overall survival is not inferior to a double lung transplant. So I think the whole gamut of a single lung versus a double lung depends only on two things. One, as Chaitanya very, very aptly mentioned, the frailty of the patient, the ability to sustain the you know long surgery, which is there. And second, the most important issue is the practical and the logistic issue of how many uh, you know, patients are on the waiting list versus how many donors are available. If we are able to meet this balance, which in our country fairly till date we are able to meet, there is a good number of donations that we are seeing now. It is going on increasing, especially in the South Indian states. But the number of recipients that we have is not that very high. We don't have thousands of recipients listed across all the five or six active programs that we have. So we are at an advantage. We are, you know, at a leisure to offer a bilateral or a double lung transplant to a majority of these patients. So, you know, clearly as a dictum, when there is a suppurative lung disease, or when you are dealing with a lung disease plus severe pulmonary hypertension, this definitely you need to offer them a bilateral lung transplant. You don't have an option. All the other cases, be it an ILD, connective tissue ILD, be it a COPD, they really can benefit equally with a single lung transplant plus undergo a less invasive procedure, which is there, uh, undergo a lesser duration of anesthesia. And of course, because the sternum will be spared in these cases, the recovery will also be faster. Now, moving on to what you said about a combined heart and lung transplant, as I uh, brought out the data in my slide, only and only if there is a left and a right heart failure. So if you see a right heart dysfunction along with, um, you know, because of severe pulmonary hypertension or because of a pulmonary disease, stabilize these patients. These are the patients who need not be subjected to transplant as an emergency. There are a lot of things that can be done especially things like dobutamine, IV mildrenone. We do a lot of home mildrenone therapy for these patients where for two or three weeks they are on uh, you know, a sustained release pump of mildrenone and they go home with that. So, of course, we uh, advise them to check their blood pressures and you know check the vitals very frequently as they're connected to us over an application, a phone application and are on under constant monitoring. But this really helps to bring down this pulmonary pressure and we can get away with a lot of morbidity during the transplant surgery itself. So correction of this right ventricular dysfunction preoperatively, some patients even require to go on a preoperative ECMO, an elective ECMO before the transplant to reduce this pressure, to reduce the strain on the right ventricle. And these patients, you can really get away with a bilateral lung transplant instead of a combined heart and lung transplant because this right ventricle will reverse over a period of next three weeks to three months. But yes, if the left ventricle is bad, or if you are really dealing with an Eisenmenga, be it a corrected or be it an uncorrected congenital heart disease or a severe cardiomyopathy, definitely you have to offer them a combined heart and lung transplant. So just uh, I want to um, uh, quick, I, I need a quick clarification apart. So what happens uh, uh, when you do a single lung transplant in its uh, emphysema predominant COPD patient with severe PAH? You do you offer him a single lung transplant even then the rv uh, reverses rv reverses yes. so okay. like i said if you're dealing with an, a severe emphysema with severe pulmonary hypertension this is not a candidate for a single lung transplant he will require a bilateral lung transplant but say we are dealing with severe emphysema with mild or moderate pulmonary hypertension this is a candidate that can be offered a single lung transplant of course it is going to be a nightmare in the post-operative period for, you know, for us, the pulmonary critical care people who are dealing with these patients in the ICU. And I would say more than 50% of these patients, when you're doing a single lung, will require differential ventilation. Otherwise, the dynamic hyperinflation of the native lung is going to kill the lung. It's right. going to kill your right. transplanted lung. Plus right. the perfusion, it will follow the path of least resistance. So most of the blood will be shunted into the transplanted lung. So right. accordingly, you have to maintain your enotropic balance. You have to maintain your ventilation to make sure that the transplanted lung is not insulted by the native lung that you're left behind. And once that four day, five day period window you have crossed over, you have crossed over from the period of primary graft dysfunction, then it's all good. The patient will do fairly well. He'll do equally good as compared to if you would have offered him a double lung transplant surgery. Right. That was uh, crystal clear uh, upper. Uh, Dr. Pallavi, so you were called in along with Hush to assess for a patient or a, a deceased donor, whether they, this lungs fits for the um, 
listed recipients one two three four so how do you pick the uh, this lungs is going to fit for this particular uh, recipient uh, see there is a very straightforward uh, criteria earlier uh, i mean historically when we used to do it was it was very simple heart is weight and uh, lung is height uh, we've moved on forward from there and now we are looking at a predicted uh, total lung capacity and we take a criteria based on uh, age sex and height of the patient to be able to assess uh, whether this uh, lung is uh, fit for the donor or not having said that uh, despite uh, doing our best efforts there might be some mismatch in a lot of patients and uh, it is ideal to have the right match and then if you have to go, err on the side then you should be erring on the side of uh, the lung being a slightly larger wherein you can uh, do a wedge resection or a segmentectomy and still be able to transplant that lung we should never err on the side of a small lung fitting into a large chest space okay right dr chaitanya in the same scenario you were called in and then uh, you are going to assess whether this lungs the disease lung uh, uh, um, whether they are fit for transplant or not what are the various things various checklists that you will see before uh, giving heads up to your thoracic surgeon yes these are the perfect lungs then we can transplant these uh so you mean a, do a donor lung assessment or the recipient lung assessment a donor donor yes process. yeah so donor lung assessment we'll get a uh, uh, prerequisites like we get a chart of the donor lung that how is the donor we get a basic x ray of the patient and abg and uh, basic details of the blood work we'll get before the uh, uh, assessment process as such so once we get the what them if we if the x ray is crystal clear and if the patient is febrile his wbc count is normal he is on a minimal uh, antibiotic support and uh, if uh, usually if it is a multi organ transplant if they get a ct abdomen we'll ask them for a screening ct chest also if we have an option or if you have the luxury or else if the x ray is fine we'll go and we'll see the patient we'll assess the donor and we'll do a donor bronchoscopy if the donor bronchoscopy is not showing much purulent secretions if there is localized mucoid secretions causing some collapse or something that's still acceptable so uh, the the ideal lungs are there are not much secretions no purulency and there are no aspiration because majority of the lungs what we get uh, are because of the road traffic accident so we'll have this aspirated material into the lungs so no food particles and everything so that is the ideal lung but in some cases even if there are subtle changes in the uh, secretion consistency or something also we still accept if uh, the pa uh, abg is reasonably good and they will be further assessed on table if there is a preliminary assessment what we do prior to the transplant where we think if they are still okay but there is to be a final assessment done on table the surgeons will open the chest cavity they'll see the lungs if there is any consolidations they'll try to if there is any some contusions or something they'll try to recruit it manually and if the lung expands there uh, we can just transplant the lungs but now uh, evlp is another uh, advanced technology where we can keep the lungs in that evlp that means a borderline lungs not every lungs we'll keep the borderline lungs in the evlp machine we'll run it for 4 hours we'll access the from the pulmonary veins we'll access the uh, abgs frequently and we'll see it so if the lungs survive for 4 hours in that evlp machine then they are suitable for transplant even if there is subtle x ray changes or some mild ct changes also we can still take those for transplant So, Vijay, I'd like to just pitch in over here. There yeah. is a very easy scheme to remember when we are going for donor assessment, and I think for a large number of pulmonologists, this might be helpful. I call it my A B C D E. You look at the A B G. You look at the bronchoscopy. You look at contusions on the lung. You look at deposits. This could be a deposit of blood. This could be a deposit of soot. This could be a deposit of calcium. And then with the E, you look at the external surfaces of the lung. That means the pleural cavity. You look at eccentricity, is the presence of nodules when the lung has been opened up by the surgeon. You look at the need for excisions, and finally, you look at the need for using an EVLP. So, can you please explain? You know what does this EVLP contains, and then how do you you use it? And as Chaitanya was clearly mentioning. Four hours trial period. What is this four hour trial period? So, Vijay, you're asking me to take another webinar in itself, but I'll no, be no, no. Please, <laughs> this is for you know. See, we have to. If you want to get a right uh, 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 recipient, 
okay, right patient to be referred to the transplant center, we pulmonologists need this minimum amount of knowledge so that we can understand and then refer the right patient back to you. So EVLP, if I am putting it very colloquially and just in a few words, if I have to explain it, so it is nothing but uh, you can call it sort of an advanced ECMO device. So this is an artificial platform where the excised lung, the explanted lungs can be put. It can be perfused, continuous perfusion can be maintained, continuous ventilation can be maintained. And simultaneously, the good thing is you can administer antibiotics, you can administer drugs to improve the health of the lungs. Plus, the lungs can be put under constant monitoring, which is done every few minutes to ascertain what the pH is, how the oxygenation and carbon dioxide balance maintaining is, how the lactate is, and various other inflammatory markers can also be studied simultaneously. Now, four hours is the defined period, but yes, longer periods of study have also been done. There are different protocols using the steam solution, using a mix of blood and steam solution. And I think Toronto General Scharf has his own solution, which will be you know coming out for commercial use also very soon. I think 2025, Chaitanya Harsh, you can tell, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. 2025 Shaf solution available. Yeah, they are doing studies on that. They are doing yeah. the adding the nutrients also for the regular steam solution to uh, so, make the lungs perform better on a VLP. Basically, this is an artificial medium, and this is going to be an intermediary medium wherein a lung, which is originally a marginal donor lung, can be put on this platform to improve the health of the lung so that. From marginal, it can be brought into a you know, typical donor criteria lung and then it can be transplanted into the recipients. The basic advantages are you reduce the incidence of primary graft dysfunction, you reduce the incidence of early rejections, plus you reduce the morbidity that the patient faces from you know, ventilatory uh, insults and from perfusion insults because of the uh, you know, ischemia produced by anastomosis in the early postoperative period. My dear pulmonologists, EVLP is nothing great, though there is a lot of you know, work uh, that has and a lot of research have occurred. It is something like as simple. The analogy is before we extubate our patients in ICU, what we do, we do a TP trial or minimal pressure support trial. If they succeed, de definitely we are going to extubate those patients. If they don't succeed, depending on the COPD or depending on the etiology, we are going to use other measures, how to uh, uh, wean the patients from ventilator. Similarly, this is a EVLP is some um, method where transplant pulmonologists and transplant team, they assess the viability of the lung and the chance of having a successful transplant outcomes in the post transplant period. So and if I don't call upon Ashwadhan Puri now, he's going to stab me. OK, I know, I know. Thank you for so much patience, Dr. Hush. And um, so, uh, I've seen your video. I've seen your video. I can say this confidently. How dare you to do a bronchiectatic patient transplant as your first patient? <laughs> huh? Really, you need to have a lot of guts here. Huh? Yeah. So, yeah. Really so, appreciate for a successful outcome. If you can do it, um, correct me, Dr. Appar and Chaitanya, if you can do a bronchiectatic patient, a successful transplant, you can do it in any other uh, patient as well. Over to you, Hush. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks for that. Uh, things are, uh, two things I want to tell. It's a donor management thing. Uh, uh, first thing is it should be uh, done by uh, the transplant team. It should not be done by the local uh, interventionist. They, I, I uh, sometimes hear a lot of bad stories that uh, we had a lung donor, but we rejected him because he had a small patch in the right upper lobe and all the stuff. So assessment should be done based on chest X-ray, the CD scan and P by F ratio. If the P by F ratio is bad, like it's marginal, like Dr. Apar was saying, it's 280, 270, 280, just do a bronch on that patient recruitment, good recruitment, fluid restriction, vasopressor distribution, and then assess the lungs at 100% FiO2. If you're getting a good P by F ratio of above 300, let the transplant surgeon and transplant pulmonologist take this decision of rejecting that those lungs, because that's how we can increase the donor pool. One thing and the other thing is on-site assessment. When we open the chest, we do a lot of palpatory assessment. We do a uh, five minutes under the uh, FIO2 test and see the uh, um, P by F ratio at the, at the spot. And also a compliance test where we just disconnect the ventilator, see how the compliance of the lung is. So after all this, the lungs are 
taken up or not take not taken up first of all first first question uh, that donor uh, thing the other thing is sir is that, yes it was a nightmare for a surgical uh, surgically to uh, do a transplant on a bronchiectatic lung the pneumonectomies were are very difficult uh, but the point is that that, that patient has uh, had no pulmonary hypertension so technically it was easier for thoracic surgeon it was it was a usual thing because we do a lot of these uh, uh, and destroyed pneumonectomy so for us it was a uh, okay thing but uh, it was better because that patient had no pulmonary arterial hypertension so next three transplants or four transplants like just uh, we did on ild so it, it's it's a common thing i think i i'll put this question to dr apar in india i think the most common uh, indication it's 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 ild it's not copd as in the west Absolutely true, Harsh. Most of the cases, about ninety-five percent of the cases that we do are yes, ILD, and then uh, you we do a little bit, you know, good number of bronchic cases, and only then the COPDs come in. I think you know Vijay is also here, and he has a whole cohort of six COPD patients, but they do very well with bronchodilators, with home energy yes. therapies, home oxygen therapies, and they've come to a point where many of these patients become. far advanced into the disease and go beyond the age and frailty criteria and won't need a transplantation so i think copd across the world as you've seen from the islt data also the numbers is reducing but yes. alas in, uh, you know we don't have such therapies for ilds and for the bronchiectasis patients so definitely they continue and i'd like to expand on one point so harsh has brought in beautifully one point vijay and this is something important that should go across that when you talk about donor You lung know, assessment. I I don't like to call it lung assessment because when the transplant team goes and Harsh has nicely said that it needs to be decided by the transplant team, the surgeon and the pulmonologist because it is not just lung assessment. It includes donor assessment as well as donor management. So calling in the transplant team right at the tenth hour when you are about to shift the patient into the OT for explantation of various organs is actually not correct. you need to give the transplant team enough duration of time and there usually is about you know 6 to 7 hours prior to shift wheeling in the patient into the ot is always available with the donor hospital and this time should be made you should be utilized for optimizing comprehensively the donor so what happens is in our country because liver and kidney transplant has far exceeded in numbers and in durations it's been there for many years before lung and heart the emphasis goes there so lot of fluid is pumped in the inotropes are managed accordingly as per the liver and kidney protocols but if you look at it from a thoracic point of view for the heart and and for the lungs these are counterproductive so the donor needs to be looked at as a holistic person he is not one organ that we are looking at so appropriate fluid management appropriate ventilation appropriate circulation and then appropriate antibiotics need to be administered to this donor to make sure that each and every organ is utilized maximal organ utilization is what we are looking at so the team needs to be given adequate amount of time most insulted organ is the lung because usually there will be chest trauma there will be some degree of contusion in the lung and then when you are giving too much of fluid the pf ratio will fall the peep is not maintained well frequent suctions and bronchoscopies are done again loss of alveolar recruitment again the pf ratio goes down if you are given a period of 4 hours all this can be reversed a organ which would otherwise be deemed and you know stamped as unusable can be made usable without having to use evlp see evlp is a great dream but you need to remember that the entire equipment costs around 2 crores and each time you put the lung on evlp it costs about you know 15 to 20 lakhs per patient 20 lakhs and when the patient has to pay this out of pocket this is beyond and you know exceeding the 30 or 40 lakhs package that the patient is already paying for transplants how many patients in our country do you think can afford this plus there is legalities if we accept an organ put it on evlp we cannot discard it we are supposed to use it so we are nowhere near the western legislatures for utilizing of you know, evlp over here so we still are a far away where we can use evlp in our regular transplant practice but yes donor management is something that we need to help with so to add on uh, one th- majority of the okay. times they'll keep the donor supine when once the they think that it's a uh, possibly for multi organ donations the liver team first runs in and they for maintenance of blood pressure and everything they'll just make supine and by the time we 
get in there will be a lot of uh, aspirations going on into the lung that definitely seems uh, makes the lungs unacceptable as such so subtle as dr appar told the subtle uh, changes from the regular way of the icu people managing the donor organ the donor body so i think we need to de- definitely add on something to the icu guys to make it more feasible for us to step in so as a conclusion a smart pulmonologist or smart transplant pulmonologist is the one who assess not the lung but he assess as a donor management in terms of multi organ transplant and also so who can potentially save patients money by avoiding evnp True. so that's what so uh, next question to chaitanya so you would have come across significant number of bronchial cases in this particular group of patient there may be cystic bronchitis there may be cystic fibrosis there may be uh, post tubercular bronchitis i'm sure in uh, uh, canada there are there may not be any post tubercular bronchitis but definitely cf is much more prevalent there so what is your take when do you take uh, these patients for transplant um, second important thing is we commonly see in india i would uh, rope in even apar for this so uh, the lot of mdr bugs you name even uh, in community acquired pneumonias from cystic bronchitis patients or uh, other bronchitis patients there are lot of mdr organisms like pseudomonas klebsiella and acinetobacter that colonizes in these patients do you take such patients for transplant or not if not why if yes how yeah that's a very good question sir uh, because uh, definitely the uh, microbiology is very different from the western compared to our because they rarely see tuber classes they see more of mycobacterium atypical mycobacteria and maximum they see pseudomonas which is pan sensitive but which is rare in our cases as such so uh, whenever we are just thinking of about the bronchitis we have a rare cystic fibrosis is not very common for us but bronchitis is definitely more common for us so we definitely should keep the infections under control we have to see the patients previous uh, culture sensitivity reports as such uh, to see what organism is frequently growing and whether that can be treated uh, or whether that is life threatening after the immunosuppression if it is a significant mdr or something then we still have time to optimize the patient unless and until it's, if it's because transplant majority of the time is not an emergency surgery we should have some time to optimize the patient before the surgery so we'll treat them with adequate antibiotics based on his previous culture sensitivity reports and everything or we if we get it we uh, just uh, have the same cultures everything again and to see because this guides us post operatively also to see what's going on and uh, Uh, patients with mdr organisms are sometimes at a risk of chronic rejection also after the transplant so uh, especially some kind of fungi and so we need to definitely optimize that uh, first of all all the uh, bugs bacterial we can treat because two weeks of antibiotics and nebulized uh, inhalation agents nebulized antifungals or nebulized antibiotics we still can give and optimize the patient because after the transplant anyway those lungs will be gone and he will be with the new set of lungs and chance of recurrence of these organisms are a bit rare and but unless and until if the patient is having coexisting sinus infection that need to be treated aggressively uh, because sinus is at the source of infection post operatively uh, coming to tuberculosis is very tricky in our country so we need to definitely rule out active tuberculosis before the surgery if there is the patient is having active mdr tuberculosis then it's definitely a contraindication for surgery because it will flare up badly after the immunosuppression so patient should be adequately treated so that's then again the point comes that patient shouldn't be referred in an emergency situation once we think that this is an end stage bronchiectasis if the patient is requiring minimal oxygen support at that time we should start optimizing the patient to prevent infections re- refer him and list him and then uh, keep him on our priority and to see if he gets transplanted before he gets a new infection yeah, having trained in west apart okay yeah. and then you have plenty of experience now back in india so what are your takes in the same case of bronchiectasis so let me make my case vijay i come back to you with a question how many yeah. bronchiectasis patients have you referred for a transplant as per the criteria before they develop pulmonary hypertension before they develop life threatening hemoptysis hardly men hardly one thing so let me uh, let me add my view here see it is because of lack of awareness second important most important thing is our patients somehow they have a uh, 
mental block or thought block that reaching transplant is something like this may be end of my life or something like that. So this kind of uh, thoughts we have to make sure that we should not nurture them. We should make sure that counter, um, oh, I can say, we, we, we can explain them properly. We should uh, educate them properly, counsel them properly, along with the support systems, particularly family, bronchiectatic patients, family, uh, they suffer a lot. So that's why I believe if we can transplant uh, only bronchiectatic patients, we have thousands of patients waiting for transplant. Exactly. So now coming to your point, this is the whole difference. We don't see those ideal patients in our practice. Most of the patients are sent late to us. So mm -hmm. as Chaitanya has elaborated, all this is very good in the West, but we have to deal with what patient we get. So let's talk about bronchiectasis first. So what we do and how we do it, we do get patients with almost all these bronchiectasis patients will have either pseudomonas or klebsiella or some even might have some you know acinetobacter in their lungs and these are biofilms that means that it is just not going to go away with whatever treatment you do chaitanya brought up a good point that you know these lungs are going to go away but we need to remember bronchiectasis is an airway disease there is colonization in the trachea and the bronchial tree as well so when we are assessing this patient or when we are working up this patient for uh, transplantation at that point of time we have to ascertain with tracheal washes and bronchial washes that what is this particular flora which is present in the trachea and in the bronchus otherwise this will trickle down into the new transplanted lung and give you problems once immunosuppression comes into view so pre-operative nebulized antibiotics nebulized tobramycin or nebulized cholestin or you know simply nebulized gentamicin these are some things that we use very frequently in preparation of these patients even before the transplant and continue with the same after the transplant. So tackling infections in bronchiectasis is easier. Now let's talk about these MDR pathogens that you spoke about. Yes, MDR Klebsiella, MDR Pseudomonas, MDR Acinetobacter, these are a nightmare, but yes, with source control when the lungs having gone, there is a high chance that these patients will do well unless this infection has trickled into blood leading to sepsis. Then the patient becomes sort of a contraindication. You need to clear the sepsis before you take this patient up for surgery. But many a times these patients are on ECMO preoperatively. At that point of time, you have to take a clinical call whether the patient is going to die without the transplant or the patient is going to survive the transplant even with sepsis being under control with antibiotic sampling. Coming on to the more virulent organisms, Burkholderia cepesia and the new emerging Elizabeth uh, you know, meningoseptica or Elizabeth, the king egg group. Yeah. These are two organisms which are definitely considered to be dangerous if these are present in the blood. And I'm not talking about the growth just in bowel. If these are present in blood, you need to wait. You need to keep treating them. You need to have two, if not three, negative cultures for these organisms before you take up the patient for a transplant. Otherwise, you're writing a death warrant for this transplant. Going back to tuberculosis, as my teacher from the West, Dr. Harish used to always say, as a pulmonologist from India, you are also a tuberculologist. And if you can't treat tuberculosis, you have no business to be in transplant. So we need to manage TB. Completing six months of therapy may or may not happen depending upon the clinical condition of the patients. If the patients are very sick, we see many, you know, uh, patients of ILD or COPD who've been on long-term steroids and developed TB because of that, and are at you know uh, the need for transplant on 10 liters of oxygen or already on niv requiring therapies you can't wait for six months for these patients the patient does not have six months of time there you need to take an informed decision when the family is involved and where all the you know parties are uh, the the transplant team is involved whether or not to take these patients up actively and continue att depending upon whether the lymph nodes are positive or whether the tb is there elsewhere in the body Yes, my atypical mycobacterium, especially mycobacterium abscesses, is again one condition that will lead to demise of the patient and early rejections, chronic rejections also post-transplant. So again, these have to be considered and managed appropriately. There is one infection that in particular I need to bring up HIV. Now this is, as it is, it is a I'll paradox. Come there, I'll come there. <laughs> okay, then we'll talk about it at that point of time. <laughs> right. Excellent. Right. Mm. Coming to uh, Dr. Pallavi, see, 
what is your take if a patient is being referred and then cleared from id perspect and then cleared from uh, pulmonology perspect that this patient can be um, uh, transplanted despite having hiv because viral uh, load is zero and there is uh, or you please explain as brief as possible what is the in given scenario if if the patient is hbs hg positive or hepatitis c positive and hiv positive what is your take uh, <clears throat> actually uh, hiv with a zero viral load and if the patient is in a not in a very immunosuppressed state it's no longer a contraindication for offering a lung transplant uh, as far as uh, hcv and hbs ag goes hbs ag if controlled is again not a contraindication for offering lung transplant hcv is slightly more tricky we have to look at the hcv viral load and at the same time uh, see whether this patient is going to be uh, compliant to the long term therapies both for the hcv and the lung transplant so i would say that uh, hiv with a well controlled patient is not a patient i would refuse transplant today so you have bought in a very uh, wonderful uh, thing uh, concept what is the compliance with the medications in the given patient so compliance history uh, is very very important before you check in or uh, tick in for the clearance for transplant so if you see past couple of years if the patient is not adhering to the given treatment whether it is copd or ild or whether the patient is following up with the um, you know, treating pulmonologist appropriately or not if he is not following then there itself you can reject the patient uh, for lung transplant program am i correct dr harsh sir definitely sir adherence to uh, the previous therapies the general behavior of the patient his family support his social systems are a very uh, important part of um, our assessment for considering a patient for transplant if if he is a defaulter by he will default on immunosuppression in the post operative period he won't uh, be following the uh, uh, this follow up physiotherapy protocols then then it will be mess that that transplant would sir, right. see we are a organ deficient uh, uh, country we can't mess up with the, the organs which we have we have to provide those organs to the best suited individuals which would uh, really need them uh, so, i think dr apar would uh, agree with me the pallavi i just want to add one small point it's with every surgery that we do in this country today not just uh, lung transplant patient has to earn the surgery in the sense that the patient has to want it and he has to be compliant enough to want it whether it is the obesity surgery whether it is a lung transplant surgery any surgery is a major undertaking on a human body and compliance is the bare minimum and unless we have assessed it fully that the patient really wants it these are not surgeries to be offered lightly so the message to the treating pulmonologist is if your patient is not turning up to you regularly for your consultations and follow up this patient you are not supposed to refer to a transplant center as simple as this coming to uh, chaitanya chaitanya can you please add what is the important checklist like as we discuss right now a uh, patient who with poor compliance we are not supposed to uh, refer to a transplant center what are the other things like if such as kind of scenario example maybe drug abuse heroin cocaine kind of thing smoking alcohol what a what a you take i uh, first chaitanya and then followed by apar yeah uh, sir uh, this uh, assessment is 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 of two processes one is assessing the person himself himself like other comorbidities from different organs and other things so if he is medically fit is one thing and psychosocially and financially fit is a second aspect so medically fit will do a bunch of tests for cardiac evaluation for other system involvement cancer screening check and everything so the keeping that apart if uh, to answer your question straight so the the COPD definitely smoking is a risk factor so the patient should not smoke for a minimum of 6 months at least uh, because active smoking is not advised for a lung transplant recipient uh, so there should be a proper counseling for the patient that he, there should there should be he should be strictly abstinent from smoking alcohol and now there are a lot of drugs which are legalized across the world and uh, like marijuana cocaine and everything and everything should be definitely avoided all throughout the procedures when when the patient himself is like 
he wants a transplant then definitely means he should be away from all these and we should counsel him properly and compliance because we are not we don't have the privilege that we are offering lungs for a, it's like not a government run program so definitely they have to pay from their pocket so if they are compliant enough they can buy the medicines uh, even finances are strict thing in our aspect because it's not free of cost the post operative medicines cost a huge bunch of the patient because they need to take throughout their life so even missing couple of days of medications will cause rejection will trigger rejection so uh, patient initial post operatively they'll be having a lot of issues to deal with coming out of the surgery lot of pain uh, coming out of that pain and uh, going to the physio and everything so they need a proper support person to deal with all these things so a proper educated or at least a person who can understand at what time what medication needs to be given should be there beside the patient for at least a month after the transplant till the patient can do on himself so a proper support social person and a good financial support and third thing is that again patient should be well aware of the consequences of not taking medications on time so apart from the the three main anti rejection medication they'll be ha- they'll be on lot of pills like anti fungal prevention anti viral cmb preventive medications so there are other bunch of medications for the first 6 months at least so they should be aware that a transplant doesn't mean that just replacing an organ and he can be free of the disease they should be on lifelong medications that should be counseled properly they should understand that they should take medicines on time and regularly and if there is any uh, and these cause lot of side effects like kidney damage and lot of other organ effects also liver issues kidney issues and even if there is a mild impairment of anything then they should report to us immediately and they should undergo frequent blood tests bronchoscopies and everything so they should be counseled properly before undergoing this transplant dr appar anything you want to add here so you know uh, there is a very uh, simple straightforward objective assessment which has been provided and it's called the pittsburgh transplant mental assessment questionnaire so this is a mix which uh, utilizes different uh, questionnaires integrated into one questionnaire to look for substance abuse to look for anxiety disorders to look for depression as well as manic disorders and to look for personality disorders finally there is also an interview in this questionnaire with the family to look at the family or the social support structure and the beauty of the questionnaire is that it divides the patient into three different categories if your score is very low you are rejected for a transplant you might be fit from a medical perspective but unless you are psychologically fit you don't deserve the transplant as pallavi said you need to earn your surgery i totally agree with that secondly if you fall into the medium range in, into the you know 7 to 11 category then you need to be revisited by the psychologist every week till you either go into the contraindication or into the approved for transplant category and only those patients which clear all the different questionnaires who do not who prove themselves to be worthy of the transplant on a psychological mental psychological cognitive psychological level or a cognitive behavior level these are the ones who should be taken up for the transplant actively so i think this is one questionnaire which should be handy with every transplant pulmonologist and while assessing the patient while working up the patient even before listing the patient the patient has to undergo all these details many of our patients will have profound depression whether that be ild or whether that be a copd patient because they are sick for a long period of time that depression is profound so instead of hurrying to take them up for a transplant and then facing complications in the post transplant period i think spending a month or spending two months to improve their mental health and then you know offering the surgery to them takes a you know much it provides a much much stronger survival benefit to these patients thank you uh, dr appar ultimately the medical fitness and uh, financial fitness psychological fitness and social support uh, system has to be perfectly in so to uh, get a green flag for transplant so so here our friend from nagpur dr ajay is asking what is the strategy this question is directed to apar what is the strategy to prevent pulmonary tuberculosis in post transplant phase in a patient with family history of pulmonary tb or mdr tb i don't want to make it complicated leave about mdr okay what do you do if if there is an exposure history in of pulmonary tb in the family so- even if it be mdr vijay i think the answer is very simple frequent and routine monitoring 
you monitor chest x rays you monitor you know uh, the blood levels of immune suppression the tetromel levels levels the counts of the patients and uh, you know the most important step here would be to educate the patient and family to identify symptoms at the earliest onset of symptoms they need to report back to the transplant unit i don't think in our country there is something still existing which can prevent tb only thing we can identify it early and we can start treatment at an earlier stage before the disease progresses yeah dr soumya from hyderabad is asking if the patient doesn't tolerate the structured rehab program do you still consider do you rethink of idea of transplant and if at all what ways can i ask uh, puri to answer this sir definitely i will rethink about it because then uh, the patient is not compliant no so probably you know we have to as uh, uh, dr uh, apar was mentioning we should counsel him properly make him yes. uh, multiple make attempts should be done to, the, to all the yes. rigid protocols and then give yep apar please there are two aspects to this question one is that the patient is not able to do because the patient is sick see yeah. all our end stage lung disease patients they become so be profoundly uh, sarcopenic they lose muscle mass they lose bone mass if they are not able to tolerate the rehabilitation because of physical uh, you know fitness abilities and there is not much that we can offer them unless we correct the hypoxemia by way of transplant those are patients who you would still think of including into the transplant list because they are at least showing the effort to participate the will to participate into a rehabilitation program is there so of course it is going to be a high risk transplant the mortality rate might be higher as compared to a normal patient because of the physical frailty but if they do survive the surgery there is a good chance that these patients will have an outcome which is similar if not inferior to any of the other patients but yes patients who refuse to participate in a rehabilitation program they are not on my list one right. thing to add on the frailty is very important sir in these cases because if the patient is physically not fit to even do a rehab or something like that if he's too frail then uh, i think uh, by that time he'll be losing significant amount of muscle mass he'll be underweight at bmi will be low that will be very high risk for the transplant as such but we need to optimize that even if the patient is not coming to the rehab center or whatever it is we can do these online sessions of doing a minimal 20 minutes of standing walking a regular small walking near the bed or something like that if he is frail enough then i think we can go ahead with the transplant right see uh, coming to next question uh, chaitanya to you uh, again uh, dr soumya was asking immediate complications which a pulmonologist should identify and the role of bronchoscopy in pre and post transplant in a gist be as brief as possible is yeah, a pre transplant that's way how you how we are managing uh, like uh, if the patient dev- to diagnose and i think once ild is diagnosed there is nothing much we can offer with the bronchoscopy and but copd definitely the bronchoscopic airway lung volume reduction and everything we can offer for upper lobe predominant patients so these are the two main uh, diseases if we can talk about pre transplant but post transplant first three months patient will be near the transplant center located near the transplant center so they will be relocating so first three, three months if there is anything which can be usually identified by the transplant team but after that if they relocate to their own place and if they don't have the time to come over then the main thing is that uh, when the patient complains of some breathing difficulty or cough uh, immediate x ray uh, to look out the common infections and uh, uh, rejection these are the two complications which we usually face uh, pneumothorax is less common post operatively uh, that to after 3 months so uh, and pulmonary embol- embolism is a third thing so these three should be the main differential diagnosis to consider if the patient worsens after that and uh, once the patient reaches a pulmonologist then if if you if we think that then it's something like this then and uh, definitely should be in contact with the uh, treating transplant pulmonology team and should proceed accordingly bronchoscopy is only indicated if there is something like a total lung collapse sometimes because of thick adhesive secretions around the anastomosis which may cause some collapse uh, but usually a bit rare after uh, the initial first 3 3 to 4 months if they are fine the anastomosis is okay unless and until there is a secondary infection around the anastomosis usually we uh, schedule everything like 3 months 6 months we'll just reassess the patient and do a bronch so um, emergency bronchs are usually a bit less only when unless and until there is a mucus plugging right thank you apar you want to say something so which i was very fortunate to work with uh, you know the 
great doctors from us and with atul mehta i have written a paper which was published last year in the journal of cardiothoracic and vascular surgery in the transplant edition where we've given a review on the airway complications and how to manage them post transplant in the post lung transplant patients so i think bronchoscopy is a very important tool that we need to utilize and across the world the transplant pulmonary you know uh, think tanks have are divided into two different sections i think what toronto follows is indication bronchoscopies and there is another school of thought which has originated from pittsburgh which is called as surveillance bronchoscopy yeah it's surveillance so, bronchoscopy here also so far accepted across the world and uh, you know given our country given our burden of uh, infections respiratory infections and exposure to pollution i think going ahead with surveillance bronchoscopies is a better bet rather than indication bronchoscopies in our country plus many of our patients are from outside areas they are from far away areas and they will not be able to come to you very frequently or in a very short duration of time if they fall sick we don't have the abilities to air evacuate these patients to the nearest transplant unit in a jiffy so i think surveillance bronchoscopy goes well what i practice in my unit is daily bronchoscopy is at least for the first 7 to 10 days when the transplant has been done unless there is primary graft dysfunction and i don't want to disturb the peep and following that it goes on to you know alternate day bronch and then you know once a week bronch till the patient is discharged now if there is appearance of any sort of airway complications and i'm not talking about just the ischemic necrosis the mucosa will slough in you know about 70% of the patients and the rest will have a good mucosa but yes if there is any granulation tissue appearing if there are any keratin horns which are being seen if there is any narrowing of the bronchi whether it is at the anastomosis or in the distal uh, airway that you are seeing which is 30% or more of the original diameter of the bronchus then yes these patients will merit from a regular bronchoscopy the, the time interval between the bronchoscopies will depend upon how sick or what the condition of the patient is it can it could be once a week it could be once in uh, a fortnight or it could be once a month and then definitely surveillance biopsies usually we practice it at one month three months six months one year and then yearly after that uh, to rule out any rejections acute or chronic chronic usually after one years and appearance of indolent infections which also will lead to early appearance of chronic rejections which cannot be identified just on the basis of ct scans so co a combination of a ct scan a pulmonary function test a echo to assess the appearance of any pulmonary hypertension immunological survey with you know donor specific antibodies with antibodies uh, looking for antibodies in the blood of the patient now liquid biopsies with cell free dna is available and an invasive lung biopsy to rule out any rejection or infection is a must and that is the role of the bronchoscopy in a post transplant patient but do you still uh, do uh, biopsies to assess for rejection or just uh, a ball is good enough no no you need no, a biopsy. biopsy one month three months six months one year and yearly after that you need yes. a transbronchial lung biopsy in the fact surveillance are, biopsies are you know mandatory mandatory predominantly in, fact, in the first six months their uh, uh, outcome is better yeah, i i just want to talk from a uh, patient family point of view for for a second see do you want uh, all your patients to relocate to toronto and then chennai or delhi no first three months first three months not after three that three months is good enough not yes. sure so no, what normally, is your take up or is so, 3 months 6 months 1 year what is your nothing. take in indian scenario post discharge from the hospital i ask my patients to be there in chennai for only one week period till they get used to being outside the hospital and then they go back to their cities you know patients who come from hyderabad or from delhi or from mumbai or from calcutta they are at an advantageous position because there are good practicing pulmonologists in the vicinity and they would have been referred also by one of these pulmonologists so the immediate complication care in consultation with the transplant team it takes a minute to pick up the phone and call me and discuss the case with me in case something is happening and these are all also interventional pulmonologists so they can do bronchoscopies and they can share results with us problem happens when patients are coming from far reaching areas these are the patients who you attach to the nearest you know good practicing pulmonologist and from there the follow up can be done so very rarely only in cases of an uh, you know severe rejection or a severe infection which requires icu care or in case of a planned surveillance biopsy like i told 1 3 6 12 and then yeah only for these i ask the patients to come back to chennai so we follow a unique method 
where every patient is connected to us by way of a WhatsApp group, and we provide them with a micro spirometer. So they do an FEC and FEV one every day, morning and evening, and they send it to us, which we collate on a graph. So wherever we see a dip happening in yep. the FEV ones of the patients, which is not going away in a period of two to three days, we actively call back the patient and ask them to get investigations done to see that whether something ha is happening. And if anything turns positive, then we call them to our centers. So very limited visits to the transplant centers. Otherwise, everything can be managed locally. So, so very similar idea. policy we are we are following it uh, daily. We are keeping the patients for fourteen days days near us, and same as Dr. Apar has told, uh, uh, the same WhatsApp group and uh, FEV one in the morning and evening. Dr. Pallavi, you agree? Yes, I mean uh, use of technology has to help uh, these patients uh, traveling or just staying uh, relocating is not an option. Right. For a transplant. Here is another uh, uh, very practical question. Uh, uh, posted by Dr. Alfred Selvin, he asks us, what is the average waiting period for lung transplant in India? One to two months, I guess, but it depends. It depends. It can be one day to, to an average of one to two months. I Dr. Think, Apar? I think it's, it, it's a difficult question to answer. If you're talking about absolutely stabbed average, I would agree yeah. with much that it is somewhere between one to two months. But yes, there are patients, especially if you look at the female ILD phenotype, which is a short female in our country, has very small lungs. You're looking at a pediatric level you know, donation for that patient. Donor. They might even wait for six months or seven months or eight months for you to get a donor from a you know smaller height and appropriate lung size. Unless the family is willing to go for a lower transplant, you knock off the lower lobes, just transplant the upper lobe or something like that. So on an average, one to two months. Yes. One to two months. So Dr. Pallavi was mentioning when I was talking to her this morning. Okay, she initiated a brilliant concept which generally happens in um, Japan, live donor. What is your take, Dr. Pallavi? See, what I feel is... In India, it is feasible. Because I, I, I remember uh, reading the literature saying that the average mortality is close to around, in the donors, of live donors, close to around 10%. That's why they have abandoned the program. So what is your take? See, I feel that uh, Japan has a different kind of uh, ecosystem in place to be able to manage a live donor lung transplant. But even and then, I, uh, the, in Japan, they are not following it now. Uh, the, uh, there are a few centers uh, which are offering very good results and they are sustainable results that they are offering. But majority of the world has not been able to reciprocate the same results. So I would not say that uh, it, it's not a thing of the, of the future or we should reject it totally. But as we stand today in our lung transplant journey of the country, I would not recommend it for now. See, if I can come in, the whole point about live lung donation is that, you know, need is the mother of all inventions. Japan and Korea, these are the two countries who have that have pioneered live lung donor transplant. And these are low bar donor, uh, low bar transplantations. And this is simply for this reason that cadaveric donation or appropriate cadaveric donation is not available in these countries. Most of the donors are above 55 years of age and most of the donors do not have fitting heart and lung uh, donation that can happen. Now, heart, you can't help it. But for the lung, yes, they have developed a concept of living um, donation where the lower lobes from right lower lobe from two donors are taken and they are uh, transplanted into both the chest cavities of the re recipient. Now, Korea has had good data come out of it. Japan had the preliminary data, but Korea now has very good data. They have, uh, you know, data of uh, close to about 400 patients, which they have followed up for a period of seven years. And the survival is again not inferior to cadaveric uh, donation, single lung or a double lung transplant. So it is something which is feasible. I right now have three patients who have been listed for live lung uh, transplant at my center, but still we are waiting for the government clearance for that. So that itself is going to be an issue over here. But yes, because we are also a donor depleted country or a donor deficient country, I think this is a good option that can be offered. The other thing is we are also very similar to the Asian race, wherein our body structure is of a shorter height uh, when it comes to lung. And you talk about the full height of the patient and you talk about the lung height of the patient, we are shorter as compared to the Western population. 
so definitely i think live donor low bar transplant is a feasibility in our country as well right thank you i would like to add one small before uh, live donor i would like uh, legislation to be made on dcd i guess that would uh, increase the donor pool that is donation of the cardiac death i think i think working very strongly yeah, on that so dcd heart is already on board dcd lung will follow very soon very soon yes that would increase the donor pool uh, majority in india mm-hmm. so uh, what uh, can i take all of your opinion what does you or we expect from government to do to increase the donor pool see i think uh, this is a very gray area that you have brought up vijay what right. do we expect the do- government to do the government is really working with us so if you look at it many states rajasthan gujarat tamil nadu karnataka telangana the government provides very good financial relief to the patients who need to undergo transplant surgeries in rajasthan they are providing close to 25 lakhs telangana provides clo- uh, i mean uh, tamil nadu provides close to 20 lakhs to the recipients if they are from below the poverty line so that is some uh, that is a great step that government has taken the De- development of transstand which was and development of zccc maharashtra these were the first two bodies to appear in the country which have promoted organ donation across the country and tamil nadu has pioneered trans- transplant programs from cadaveric donors for the rest of the country and this could not be possible without government support and that support is still continuing now very recently with the active participation of noto the central government has also pitched in and they've provided for you know they've called for or they've appealed for maximum organ utilization and for a single uh, portfolio to be developed all across the country for donations to be standardized but yes what we need more from the government is that these policies should not be limited to particular states this should be a uniform policy we need to have a third party system which is followed in the west you know chaitanya is there and we have trained in the west that there is a third party which maintains all these donors and if we can have independent maintenance of the donor not just because of that being a transplant hospital that they are more interested or that being a medical college so they are not interested in donor management all that will be mitigated somebody who will take responsibility of the donor and make sure that all the organs can be utilized is going to be the real game changer in the field of you know thoracic organ transplants at least so that is something the government intend the third and the major thing that what we want the government to do is to introduce financial aids to introduce properly trained teams into public sector programs that is really what is going to make the difference so pgi chandigarh did one transplant and then the program died down aims has done two transplant and you know there's been a lull for almost 8 months now when they've not done anything more so you know similar programs there are big hospitals across the country there is km in mumbai you know down south there is mmc there is the you know the telangana you have your un- multiple universities there these bigger hospitals who have a huge patient load and who have the capacity to develop tertiary care centers like this should take it take up the baton and set up transplant units with properly trained team to offer it to you know the patients across the country i think these are the two important points that we are yet to see from the government side brilliant inputs uh, apart so i want to announce here um, dr krishna anna's message so there are 1000 plus live logins okay we wow. have started pre uh, pre webinar itself with 250 plus logins and then now we are uh, uh, our webinar is being watched by 1000 plus people that's kudos kudos to entire cci core team uh and then sipla and then the technical team who work relentlessly to run this program this is successfully into third year and beyond and coming to uh chances of recurrences of the primary problem in the lung transplant which is another very very important thing that a treating pulmonologist and then treating team must know uh it is said that um systemic sclerosis and then other autoimmune problems they tend to recur in the post transplanted lung as well what is this what is your view so i think that is a myth that really needs to be burst over here mm-hmm. so there are there are theories for this we don't have evidence for this but there are two theories which are put forth one is when you're talking about autoimmune diseases or connective tissue diseases leading to ild subjected to transplant you are providing 
far and above over and above immunosuppression post transplant to these patients which not only controls the disease in the lung but also controls their systemic manifestations of the disease secondly the lung that you're transplanting has a different dna so the auto antibody is not really going to harm this lung it is not going to attack this same lung so there has been no reported case of a recurrent ctd ild in a transplanted lung there is no reported case so far so right. a few diseases which are subject to recurrence sarcoidosis is on top of the list yes sarcoidosis we don't know the mechanism why it comes back but that is the earliest disease to recover or to recur into a transplanted lung especially if an older donor is used or especially if an older or frail uh, sarcoidosis patient is transplanted secondly depositional diseases like pulmonary alveolar microlithiasis uh this is also known to recur in a transplanted lung there are very few case reports of things like uh, you know plch and lam also showing a recurrence but the mainstream diseases ipf iips copd still now there are not uh, you know no reported cases no reported. of these diseases coming back right. so um dr grishma jomi is asking from hyderabad which of the lung conditions post lung transplant has the lowest risk of graft rejection is there anything like that if there, if there is a primary there is a ild problem or ctd ild problem or a yeah, uh, CT, problem yes. okay ctd ild is a scleroderma so these patients have yes. gastric motility issues usually uh -huh. so the patients who have this coexisting uh, even ipf gerd is a risk factor so mm -hmm. the patients who have predominantly this gastric issues like reflux issues or delayed gastric emptying or dilated esophagus or all these patients they have high chance of recurrence because of this micro aspirations going on that is one of the significant risk factor for recurrence as such now here And, the question uh, is which condition no lung con have low lower risk of graft rejection lower <laughs> lowest risk the least risk of graft rejection is seen in a patient who is referred for transplant in a timely fashion <laughs> if the patient is not sick if the patient is fit to undergo transplant you get a do good donor for the patient that is the least risk of rejections and recurrence both right it is not oh. disease specific so a very rare conditions gray areas i want to cover here what are the chances of having a retransplanting the patient and then uh, what is your experience both chaitanya and apar i'm sorry harsh and then pallavi i'm putting you lot of them because there are a lot of medical questions that's why i am you know taking the help of apar and chaitanya please bear with me well usually also the transplant surgeon forms a very short small part of the transplanting <laughs> but they are indispensable <laughs> right yeah i of course right so you know retransplant my experience if i can really put it to you is zero we have not retransplanted any patient till now so mm -hmm. my overall transplant experience is close to 500 cases in the country now but yes not even a single retransplant as far as i i remember dr madhu shankar from chennai uh, i think uh, frontier lifeline hospital before he exited the country and went back to australia did one retransplant for an international patient and this was a case of ild that initially underwent a right lung transplant right single lung transplant in 2016 and then underwent a retransplant with a left single lung transplant in 2020 2020 to 2021 that is the only report from india that i remember of a retransplant happening so that is my experience during my training i did see a couple of retransplant and a majority of these were cystic fibrosis which were transplanted as a child and then at the age of about 18 or 20 when you know the lung could not meet the capacity of the adult uh, body they were retransplanted with adult cadaveric lungs uh, so that is my experience maybe chatanya can add a little bit more from toronto yeah actually think, uh, I, even I think, after uh, i just yeah. want to say that uh, i don't think the retransplantation is an option for india at the moment maybe you yeah. later few years later i don't know but when we have death of organs we have recipients who are there who needs uh, the primary transplant i don't think we should think of, about three transplant at the moment first i would beg to differ so if a patient is fit enough if the patient is affordable enough and if the patient fits into the criteria i don't think we should differentiate a retransplant versus a primary transplant an indication for a transplant is an indication for a transplant i guess sir but still organs organs, organs. So that that's the difference clearly i see 3 months into transplant 
and then you know many years <laughs> into transplant so apar has a wider experience i must admit that so i totally agree with you apar because if someone is really you know a need of a transplant and then he is financially viable he can sustain and he is religiously following you when the in time you have to offer a transplant right Yes, there are actually two types of retransplant. One is like Dr. Rapper mentioned that uh, the patient underwent single right lung, then uh, retransplanting the other lung or something like that. Or second thing, retransplanting both the lungs. So retransplanting both the lungs, they, these people do a lot here. Predominantly, the cystic fibrosis is the main uh, reason because the majority of the cystic fibrosis transplants at a, uh, occur at a very young age. And after uh, whatever best aspect of treatment give, the, the, even ISHLT, the survival of the lung, will be the uh, average survival will be around 7 to 8 years despite the a uh, uh, few people live 20 years 30 years after the lung transplantation but still uh, average life expectancy of the new lungs will be around 7 to 8 years maximum so after that there will be some sort of chronic lung allograft dysfunction which will be growing going on but all of these doesn't require a retransplantation though there is a subtle rejection going on they will uh, usually doesn't require much oxygen for majority of the years and after that almost 10 15 years later they may require one to two liters of oxygen something like that but uh, definitely there are few people who have this uh, gastric issues and who have this multiple rejection episodes going on immediately there is a condition called baseline lung allograft dysfunction which immediately occurs post transplant these patients will never have the normal lung function so uh, uh, attained uh, after the transplant some people because unfortunately because of multiple risk factors so these people though they are physically fit the lung function doesn't improve much and uh, over a period of 3 to 4 years they still again go back to the same situation where they are requiring oxygen so for those conditions they definitely will require a retransplantation but again the patient should be physically fit and uh, the immuno immuno medications rejections will uh, the anti rejection medications will be the same but again the surgery is a different process and already the patient have developed antibodies to the first lung what he what the patient received so the high risk of antibody mediated rejection will be there after the transplant after the second transplant but it is doable in selected population of patients but not advisable within one year of the transplant right so uh, uh, we are now uh, currently time is 9:42 oh. in in another 10 minutes we have to wrap it and uh, before closing it a very very important when a patient is having a history of carcinoma okay it can be renal carcinoma thyroid malignancy skin carcinoma melanoma so on and so forth and of course i'll also come into a uh, rarest of rare possibilities which i was fortunate enough to witness a bronchial cell carcinoma patient got transplanted when i was uh, uh, wo- as an observer at ut southwestern with uh, srinivas bolineni in 2012 they transplanted a bronchial cell carcinoma patient as well so what is your take uh, apart when a um, pulmonologist is examining and wants to refer a patient patient have had a history of, history of malignancy what is your inputs bac yes i will take up the patient i will subject the patient to transplant and then depending upon the lung involvement in the bac we can choose between a single lung versus a bilateral lung transplant when we are talking about other malignancies skin malignancies have a certain place except for melanoma all the other skin malignancies if they have not shown a recurrence in the last two years yes the patient can be subjected to a transplant but when we are talking about solid organ malignancies or when we are talking about internal malignancies then yes i need a five year you know recurrence free period before subjecting the patient to a transplant lot of our oncology friends differ when we send an opinion Uh, in you know a patient who's had a malignancy in the past they will come back saying patient fit for surgery patient can undergo a transplant because the patient has had a two two and a half year disease free period and there is a very less likelihood of recurrence but what we are forgetting is that we are going to change the patient's internal environment we are going to put the patient on immune suppression and as, as i would like to call it we it's not really an immune suppression but an immune modulation that we are achieving over here we are thinking only about the balance between how much you know immune modulation we are causing and what antibiotic prophylaxis we are giving for preventing rejection and preventing infections but the other metabolic effects we are not looking at most of our patients will become uh, you know dyslipidemic they will become hypertensive they will become diabetics if or not already there 
over a period of two to three years post transplant just because of the effect of all these drugs so what stops them from from the malignancy to recover we are actually decreasing the immune surveillance for and we are providing an environment for the malignancy to recover so my take on it is very clear i need a five year clear disease free interval for any internal malignancy skin malignancy other than melanoma at least a two year disease free interval bsc yes go for transplant yes so bsc definitely yes and another transplant at least a five year disease free or recurrence free survival if the patient exhibits then probably we can consider for taking up for transplant so we have come into the fag end of our webinar yes it looks like it's only 10 minutes back we have started it but time flew away very quickly and i now i expect one liner conclusions from each one of you uh, starting with canada chaitanya what is your message yes a transplant is a next yeah yeah when to refer that's what so, is uh, today's uh topic yeah so what is your point when a patient is diagnosed with end stage lung disease that is the time to refer so yeah apart so if you talk to me in one line because the program is targeted mostly at practicing pulmonologists i would say lose your fear of referring a patient for transplant lose your stereotypes for referring a patient for transplant open the dialogue with the patient let the patient decide connect the patient to a transplant team i think if we are if we are able to do that we our job is done and the lastly can't go without saying that we all in if it's not just for us to profess but we all today should pledge our organs as well you know sign in the place to become an organ donor today pallavi uh, what i would like to say is that uh, referring a patient is a very uh, family decision in addition to uh, the clinical decision so we should refer a patient who has the support system please be very careful about uh, a patient who undergoes a lung transplant not just uh, gets the right treatment but can follow through till the end thank you hush bye sir uh, i uh, remember the youngest small... transplant surgeon of the country <laughs> come on sir i remember a line from harrison that referral is uh, the best medicine if you are losing the game if if a transplant ref a pulmonologist at uh, in some area is losing the game he is thinking that his patient is not improving by the best best medical management or best uh, efforts just refer him to a I, I just want to add with your permission okay as soon as you realize that the patient is diagnosed with a so and so disease which is refractory to medications okay or else you are trying to reach to the maximum of medications Medic rather than you know refractory to the medications when you are trying to optimize with the maximum of medication and then pulmonary rehabilitation and oxygen everything the moment i believe the oxygen is started or yes. the moment you reach the maximum medications is started that's the where point where you have to contact the appropriate transplant pulmonologist and then try to refer to the patient sir uh, even if you need not trans uh, refer immediately but whenever uh, end stage lung disease is diagnosed you just inculcate the thought of transplant is a process start the which is still available yes start, start the just discussion just to add to start you just to add to you the moment we diagnose all these cases okay scopd which is uh, with severe air flow obstruction a, a, a ild with a rapidly progressing fibrosis something like you know a drop in fvc by more than 10% in the 6 months to 1 year period that may be even fvc may be 70% i don't yes. mind i don't yes. care yes. these are the points where uh, definitely we should try to tell them yes there is a transplant option patient may be requiring a year down the line or two year down the yes. line yes yes exactly But we should talk to them about the availability of transplant programs because 10 year back exactly a decade back it was a dream to see transplant mm. happening in this young country but now a dream has come true and now we see lot of good programs established a lot of you know uh, successful transplant programs in both in um, uh, uh, delhi hyderabad and also in chennai so that's why 
it is very very important to uh, convey our patients as soon as the diagnosis of a severe problem is been made lung issues then we should initiate the dialogue of transplant and then take an opinion from our good friends yeah. refer to chaitanya refer to apar and then others so take an opinion there is nothing wrong in it because i may be less experienced to decide but if if i send it to apar apar himself will tell this guy doesn't need transplant at this junction you manage and these are the key areas you have to watch the, when these areas when these cut off points have reached then you refer me back the patient that's how we have initiated such a dialogue many times with apar so it is very very important my dear friends so to um, uh, see that our patients deserve right treatment unless we open up the dialogue of egg transplant programs existing in in this country it is very very uh, difficult for the patients themselves to understand such a program exists in this country such a successful uh, transplant programs exist in this country that's why I, I urge each one of you, whenever you see an end-stage lung disease patients, to initiate a dialogue at the earliest, and then to transform or transfer uh, the responsibilities to trans uh, transplant teams when it is needed. With this, I would uh, uh, thank uh, sincerely my entire team of panelists, Dr. Apar, Dr. Chaitanya, Dr. Pallavi, and Dr. Hirsch, and the thousand plus live logins who have watched us for this CCA program, and then the core committee, Krishna Anna, Narayan Pradeep, and Ashish and Anil, and other technical team, Sipla, Bijal, Vinod, um, Puneet, and Vipal. With this, I'm signing off, and CCA will come back to you next Thursday with a different topic. Thank you, one and all. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Thank you all.